If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. We have a very special officer with us today. It's Colonel Ein Kilian and he's from the East Rand Riot Units. Unit 6, we call them a Dapper Dyson. This is translated to the Brave 1000. I actually served on his command, and so it was a privilege, I must tell you. In 91, I was in Tecosa. I was by then an old sergeant, in the sense that I've been a sergeant for four years. I was waiting to become a warrant officer. Already passed my test, but sadly for me, there were a few incidents. You know how it is when you work in the flying squad, there's always a car which you ride off, or there's a criminal who says you attacked him without reason. So a few things were hanging against me, so I, I couldn't be promoted, so I was there as a young sergeant, even though I was a sergeant for four years already at that stage. Now I want to say to all of you here, yeah, unless you were actually involved in the riots in South Africa in the 1980s, 1990s, even before, it was nothing like you've ever seen before if you're not used to the violence of Africa. It was not peaceful people walking around singing EP songs and things like that, smoking dacha, things like that. It wasn't like that at all. It could have been a few times, but mostly it was extremely violent. It was, in fact, I would call it a civil war uh, going on, police standing right in the middle, army trying to support as much as possible. My admiration for the officers commanding the riot units are boundless. I can tell you why, because they were being watched. Every single move they made, the lawyers, the press, the politicians, on both sides, all of them were just watching, trying to find fault and trying to cause as much trouble as they can for that officer. So, sir, you're very welcome here. I'm really grateful to speak to you again after, what, 33 years? Welcome to Legacy. Thank you for being here, sir. But I must ask you, where did this start for you? How did you end up in a South African police force? Um, Chris, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I actually joined the police the day I finished school. Um, uh, I wrote my last subject on 11 o'clock that morning. Uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, I was sworn in, and five o'clock in the afternoon, I moved into the police barracks. So I, I went directly from, from the school benches to the police station. Uh, I then spent uh, a part of December working in court, uh, being a, 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 a raw recruit. Uh, then went to the police college um, in 1970, spent six months in, in the police college. And then I was transferred. My first station was actually the then Jan Smits Airport, uh, which wasn't uh, my cup of tea because uh, it, it, was, it was a small airport those days. And uh, you had three types of jobs. You either worked in the child's office where you sat at the door to check permits of people going in and out of to the to the landing zone, and then uh, at one stage you had to sit at the like a car guard, opening a, a chain uh, for people to drive in and out to uh, uh, restricted areas. Uh, so um, I couldn't get a transfer, uh, and uh, the only way I could get away was to go to the mechanical school in Manoni for six months. Um, I then did a six month course there, and then was transferred back to Germiston, where I, my main duties was then to investigate culpable homicide vehicles that was involved in accidents. Uh, you had to investigate the vehicles and fill in a report and, and some stages give evidence in court. Um, I did that for about six months. Um, uh, I used to work on motor cars when I was still in school and a kid. I loved motor cars, still part of my being. Uh, I then went into the normal uh, uniform duties in Germiston, uh, where I met up with an old friend of mine, Dr. Johan Berger. Uh, he was actually my section sergeant. Uh, both of us were transferred back to Springs then uh, because uh, we played rugby and uh, we couldn't we couldn't get time off in Germiston to go and do rugby. But uh, anyhow, then we landed up in Springs again. And, um, I sat in Springs until 1978. Uh, when I wrote my exams to a lieutenant and then went to the police college for three months, uh, which was normal then when you wrote exams. I was then transferred to Benoni Police Station, um, 
moved from the old Benoni police station in, in, into the new, uh, then built Benoni police station. Um, uh, it was luxury for me getting this big office. I felt like a commissioner. Uh, then uh, for some reason, they transferred me back to Springs again. So I ended up in Springs uh, in the end of 1979, and um, which was very comfortable for me because I stay in Springs. And it was uh, a luxury for me. Uh, I joined the police there end of 69 and in 1979, I was a, a lieutenant on Springs. And then uh, the, the end of October, uh, I was called in to police headquarters in Springs uh, by a brigadier then, a most feared man, a brigadier, Jim Becker. Becker uh, I used to swear like a, a sailor. And um, he threw a piece of paper on my lap and said to me, I must read this rubbish. He knows for a fact it won't work. And so I read this and it was a instruction from Pretoria. We had to establish a riot units then. It was uh, not, a, not a riot unit, a, a correction, a reaction units. Uh, we had to establish a, a, a reaction unit and I was put in command to do this. And we moved back into the old Benoni police station that was dilapidated and standing vacant for more than a year. Uh, but we moved over to, uh, that was the 3rd of November, 1980. I started uh, then reaction unit six. Um, we had a couple of, uh, I, we, have, we had six districts then, and each district commandant had to send four volunteers. And that was actually this brigadier's biggest problem. He said to me, they're gonna clean the station. You're gonna get all the drunks and the rubbish and whatever. Um, so they sent me a lot of guys. We were about 30 in total, black and white. And I did get a couple of guys. Obviously, that was uh, not suitable for my needs. Uh, I'm a teetotaler. I've never drank in my life. Um, so um, we, had, after the first week, starting to feel and know each other, uh, we had a braai. And then <laughs> it was actually funny. The warrant officer then wanted to send me to his wife to go and collect a bottle of brandy for them. Um, I, I then the Monday gave them a good lecture of what, uh, what was suspected of everybody. And um, I was fortunate uh, that, that uh, the then uh, commissioner, uh, the area commissioner, Brigadier Crawford, uh, was, 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 uh, was, was, uh, uh, was a very great big help to me. And um, with his help, I sort of got rid of the, the bad guys and got some good guys from the stations, which I knew and selected and, and I draw them to the to the then unit, uh, the reaction unit. And we were initially trained then by the special task force, uh, General De Swart and his people. That was our initial training. We did a lot of other training and courses to buy the special task force. And I then started my own training section. I had on my unit an ex uh, task force member, uh, which was in, then I put in charge of my training section. And I made use of a lot of couples, uh, special guys like Joe Geron Grierson, a very well-known weapons expert that was uh, involved with a special task force and also later with a special railway task force. Um, so we, we started doing a lot of training. And um, at one stage, um, I then uh, made friends with a special task, a railway special task force the commanding officer there was Johan Lotrit, um, and we joined forces. Um, they were excellent. They were really excellent. Uh, they were very well trained, and uh, uh, we got we got the training. They were trained by GSG Nine and Israel and these places, and we got that training onto our unit because of that. We had mutual training. We had mutual. Uh, 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 we had mutual working relationships in the townships. And we got on very, very, very well. Um, me, myself and Johan Lottery, we are friends still today. And uh, a person like Andre, uh, you know, Andre, that he was a, the, the, the former commander before Johan Lottery. Uh, and Philip Skitt, and I met a lot of people, good people, excellent trained people at uh, the Railway Police, Police Task Force. And um, yeah, and from then we just excelled. Um, 
the early 80s, 80, 81, uh, the urban terrorism situation started um, and the, the police were, were getting prepared for this situation. I was then sent in 1983, I was, I, I spent some time in South West, by the way, um, border duty there. And in 1983, I was sent to uh, Ubamboland. I ended up in Ugongo, that was a, a military base. And that was uh, a very good stepping stone for me to learn uh, the, the works of the SA, uh, Puri, uh, the SA Army then. Uh, I, I, I was the liaison officer between the police and the, and the, and the SADF. And um, I, I used to go to order groups. I, I never knew what an order group was until I was based on an army base. But I learned a lot uh, about the, the, the army then. I uh, made a lot of good friends with the army. And when I came back from the border, I then uh, initiated um, uh, a good relationship between the, the army and the police. Uh, and I was given the task uh, by the then uh, the, provision, the, the commissioner uh, general, um, elected general von Seil, um, to give a lecture uh, to all the district commandants about the working relations with the, with the then army. Um, I had very, very good relationships with the army. I worked with the army with 3-2 battalion, with group 41, group 16, and I got a lot of uh, commendations and uh, certifications and certificates from the from the army uh, for the working relationship we had. And then, uh, after while I was on the border, by the way, in 1983, uh, the car bomb exploded in Church Street in Pretoria. That was the beginning of the of the terrorist attack on the country. Uh, I would say that was the starting point of it. Uh, in Benoni, uh, we uh, people forgot about this. In Benoni, we also had a car bomb right opposite the Benoni fire station. Um, luckily, nobody died there, but there was a lot of damage. They thought all the police and, and uh, 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 um, the people working at the fire station, they thought they all lived in the flats, and that was the target. Um, and then we also had the Wimpy Bar explosion in Benoni. That was very bad. Uh, a young woman got killed there. She was actually stuck around her father. Pieces were lying around. It was, it was really a really bad scene, that wimpy bar explosion. And we had uh, a lot of other incidents uh, where uh, the urban terrorism was, was, was really uh, getting a hot spot. Uh, and then uh, we, we the, the faction fight started getting serious in the townships between the, the ANC and the IFP. Uh, we picked up bodies, like you can't believe. Uh, one morning we picked up like 89 bodies. And at one stage we sat with like 400, uh, 512 bodies. I've got the newspaper clips on that. Um, the mortuaries were stacked to the ceilings. Um, so there was no place for the bodies. And what happened, is we had some bodies at Fossil Risk Police Station under a piece of canvas. And uh, some of these, one of these uh, reporters sneaked in there, took pictures, and it ended up in the London Times. And I was on the red carpet because of this. I was really uh, in big problems. And I, and I tried to explain, and, and nobody wanted to listen, that there was no, there was no places to put the bodies other than there because the, the mortuaries were really stacked. All the hospital mortuaries were stacked. Even the, the uh, off-pop and all these places were packed with the bodies. It was really, 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 really bad. And uh, you know for yourself, you've been there, that Pola Park uh, was, was a big burning point in Tokosa. And with all the hostels, we picked up bodies uh, uh, in front of hostels every morning. Um, and most of the bodies, the hands were chopped off, the feet were chopped off, they were castrated. I picked up bodies where that was beheaded. Uh, at one body we picked up with a chest was uh, hacked open and they took the heart out and actually the teeth marks was in the, in the heart that they bit out of the heart. So that was the kind of bodies that we picked up every day. And uh, at one stage we went into a hostel. We found a lot of petrol bombs there and next to the hostel was a tree and I saw some stuff hanging in the tree and I sent one of the youngsters up to go and look what it was. And he fell out of the tree, came 
out of the tree like lightning. And it was like 16 human hands hanging there like bulldog, being dried out in, in the street. Um, so, so picking up bodies was, was part of our daily routine. And, um, and, 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 uh, and I was actually one of the first people that started negotiations between the ANC and the IFP. And uh, a, a, a person by the name of Mr. Rupert Lorimar was the, the chairperson in these in these meetings. And one of the, the guys from the ANC that was associated with the Polar Park residence, uh, a guy by the name of Prince Mlambi, uh, was was the delegate of the of the ANC. And I had some of the IFP people there as well from the hostels. So we really started to negotiate and to try to get peace between us people because it was senseless. The killing was senseless. And um, um, it was it was really so bad at one stage, you know, picking up three trucks full loads of bodies, and then also we had the problems on the trains where they threw people off the trains. George Koch station from Joburg to George Koch to Catlong, uh, you picked up bodies every day along the railway lines. Uh, if an IFP uh, supporter would wrongly get into an ANC uh, coach, he would have been thrown out stabbed with a knife and thrown out of the train. So uh, we picked up bodies like, um, it, it, was, it, it was it was like mowing lawn, you know. Uh, you really you really get to a stage where it, it really becomes frustrating. Uh, and, and you try to, to keep the peace all the time. And at one stage in 1989, it was so hectic that uh, they had to send people from all over South Africa to come and join on the unit to, to help us because we were underpowered, very much underpowered. And that's where we started our relations with like three, two battalion was there, the Parabats was there. Um, so so we, we really had a lot of uh, people uh, trying to solve the problem. And it was, uh, it, it was really hectic to keep order, uh, on, you know, keep your hand on the pulse of all these different people. And and, and, and meetings and uh, then you sit with meetings at group 41 uh, planning for the week and then group 16 and then 3-2 battalion was uh, basically based in Tokoza those, those days um, but we had very very good relations with uh, with, uh, with, with this, this people and then I must especially mention people like unit 19 uh, which was a mobile unit um, they really were a very 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 big help to us Without them and without all the help, we would never have uh, succeeded in what we did. Um, the Emergency Act was then also declared. Um, I also had some dealings with Mrs. Mandela uh, when she and a soccer team turned up in uh, Catlong. In those days, they had to have a permit because of the Emergency Act to move around in another township. So coming from Soweto, you needed a permit to ride around in in Cat Long with the cause up. Um, so I, I actually warned her and told her to leave with the soccer team. Otherwise, I wanted uh, to arrest her. Uh, and, 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 and I told her she needed a permit to be there. And, and she actually said to me that when they take over the country, I'll need a permit to walk around in the streets. Um, later on, um, one evening, I was um, tasked to, uh, to meet the general next to, to, to cause a police station, General Malon. And then uh, Mr. Mandela, Nelson Mandela and Mrs. Mandela was part of the part of the group. And uh, we had them in a the Casper and we had to show them where the hostels were and where the cause was, um, because that was the main problem uh, that the people from Polar Park said they get no help from the police. Uh, in uh, in the townships and 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 we support the IFP. We don't support anybody else but the IFP. Uh, I actually was uh, at one stage tasked uh, to, to uh, they, had, they interviewed me, a woman by the name of um, um, she was a reporter. She worked for the SABC. Um, I will get you her name now. Uh, she came to my office and uh, she interviewed me because of this allegations that uh, we were blindly shooting people at Polar Park. Um, that was that was on the SABC news for a couple of nights, uh, which was obviously not the true story, not the true facts. 
Uh, it was a very dangerous place. The police was actually shot at, and even Unit 19 people were shot at uh, from Polar Park. It was a, like a squatter's camp, and it was a dangerous area to move around. You know this, um, and we never wore, we never had all this uh, bulletproof vests and stuff like that. Not today. Uh, we had this old one or two of those old big bulletproof jackets that hang down to your knees, and uh, if you're six foot tall. Uh, if you, you wear that thing for three hours, you end up being five foot five because it was so bloody heavy. You, you couldn't walk around with it. And, yeah, that was, uh, and uh, obviously I was, uh, uh, was in the, on a police diving team uh, where we, uh, we did, you know, for yourself in the coating area, there's a lot of dams and rivers and sprites. And uh, we used to go and get exhibits, uh, hand grenades and guns that I used to stack away in the, in the, in, the, in the rivers and the dams, and then obviously recovering bodies. Uh, that was my part of it. Uh, we really recovered quite a lot of bodies. But the bad part of being a police diver is to, to recover the bodies of children. Um, we actually, uh, one of the things that actually still, still uh, haunts me today, actually two of it, but one of them I'll quickly mention is an a little girl of four years old that was raped and thrown in a river at Frankfurt by a, 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 a white guy, also a 48-year-old person. And um, he ended up with his family. Uh, I don't know if they were family, but uh, they came from church. And he, she actually called him Opa. And they walked home. And the mother and father stayed behind to have some tea and cookies. And uh, he raped her. At, on the river bank and threw in the river. And it, uh, it took us three days. So we found that 12 kilometers downstream, it was a very, very difficult task, but we did recover the body. And uh, I found the murder and robbery squad then, and they came and they detained this guy. And uh, he actually, he was one, one of the actual guys that was one of the last guys that actually got hanged in this country. Um, we had to go and give evidence in the High Court in, in, in Bloemfontein, but he did hang. But it was very, very sad to get this four-year-old little girl and yourself has got kids. And, and as a being a commanding officer, you, go, you can't show any emotion. Uh, you've got to be this rock-hard person. Uh, and it is, it's just really, really an emotional kind of thing to, to get children especially a four-year-old little girl. You can imagine the suffering she went through, being raped and drowned. Um, so that was, that was really, really bad. And the other one was, my son was in the same age, nine years old. This guy uh, had this uh, Riviera in, in uh, the, the Valdra angle. Um, he was a very, very rich guy. And, uh, all the properties there, they belonged to him. And uh, they had an inboard uh, motorboat. And the his little boy of nine and his little girl were hanging on the back of this boat and they were trotting down the river. But uh, it's an inboard thing and the exhaust pipes is come, is, is, was, was right into their faces. And the next minute, the guy saw this little girl struggling and he jumped and got the girl, but the, the, the little boy was gone. The father was hectic. Uh, he summoned a helicopter from Johannesburg. Uh, the helicopter picked up an uh, off-duty cop and they were flying up and down, flying up and down the river uh, into the, uh, the, uh, the power wires and the helicopter went into the, the river. We had to take that out the next day as well. But we did find the, the little guy uh, the day after because everybody, uh, it was out of our diving area, but uh, the divers couldn't find him and then they tasked us to go and find the little boy. And we did find him. And then we also took the helicopter out of the water the next day. So that was my part of the, the, the diving situation. But rolling out bodies was my part of it uh, because of all the dams and all the water. And uh, a lot of people got drunk. Like in Boxburg Mir, this guy got drunk. He didn't want to go to the toilet. And he drowned in chest high water because he was so drunk. He, he, he weed in the water, and then he slipped and he fell, and he couldn't get up again. I didn't even put my diving gear on. I just had my rugby shorts, and I walked in, and I actually got him out of the water. Yeah, that was uh, another. The East End was tough. We had like 16 townships under us, uh, big, big areas from Delmas, Leandra, 
um, Belfort, Rattanda in Heidelberg, Tembisa, Catlong, Tukosa, Fosleris, Taiviten, Sakane, Kwatema, Dedusa. So it was a, it's a very, very, very big area. And you can imagine, um, yeah, you face crowds like up to five or 10,000, and you sit there with three Caspers with 45 people on board. Um, but with the grace of God, we got through it. I lost a couple of my guys, which is the other bad part. Um, I buried, uh, I mean, my time when I was still serving, I think uh, like 12 of my guys that I buried, some of them died uh, uh, in accidents. Uh, one guy died to how we were doing, selling out of a chopper. And uh, the other one was uh, hacked to death uh, in Daviton. Um, that was very, very bad. I actually stood there while we tried, while my paramedics tried to survive him. And uh, the sad part is two weeks after he passed, his first son was born. And uh, uh, being a commanding officer, you've got to go and face the parents on this on these situations. And uh, it's, it's it's very heartbreaking and heart-throbbing to go and tell people like this, um, your son has died. Um, I remember the other one, we we went diving at Sierswar Dam. It was on the 17th of December, actually a day after my birthday. It was raining heavy and we came back and I was I just got home and they found me the guy that dived with me uh, died in a motor accident while I was on my way home. And we just, I, I was before that dive and uh, got some hand grenades and, and guns uh, out of Sierswar Dam. So that's the, the the kind of things that you uh, to face as a as 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 a as a commanding officer, and what I also would like to mention uh, in 1986, they sent me 120 youngsters from the college, 17, 18 year olds, and uh, it was in the midst of all these problems. Uh, but luckily, we had our own uh, training facility on a farm outside Heidelberg, and what I used to do, I used to send all these guys on a six weeks training course to prepare them uh, for what was happening in the townships because it's a completely different thing going to the border and fighting in the township. Uh, township uh, was worse. I've been to the border, but the township was worse than any any border trip. Um, I've seen more dead people in the townships than people will ever see in their life on the border. Um, that was really, uh, you know, for yourself being there, and uh, it's not my, uh, thumb sucking, it's things that I've got all the newspaper clippings and evidence of this. Um, that was really, it was really, and, and I myself personally think um, every guy that served on a unit in the townships I should have had a medal given to them. Uh, I, I, I would have, that would have been an honor for me as a commanding officer to hand over a medal to any of my personnel or any guy that worked with me. Or any guy that was on a on a on a on a riot unit, and it wasn't only on the East End. East End was really a hot spot in the 80s, but places like KwaZulu Natal and even uh, Unit 10 down in Cape Town with Kailitsa and those places, everybody had, had their problems. But uh, because of the 16 townships and uh, the, the, all the areas surrounding uh, the, the, the townships. Uh, the, the, the 80s was really bad in in, in, the, Kauteng, in the then East Rand area. It was really, really, a, 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 it was like a civil war. We had the civics, we had the UDM. Um, uh, you know, at one stage, we had like Popo Molefi, Terror Lakota, and those people, uh, we conveyed them from Modabi prison to Delmas High Court for 18 months, up and down. And uh, that was my part of our duties. And we did all these uh, uh, burials. Every weekend we sat with a burial. If a guy got hit on a bicycle, they made a political, they made it a political thing. The ANC would come and bury this guy. Some of the parents never even had a say in this. And that was also a very, very, very con a confronting business. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it, was, uh, it was really tough. It was tough. It was hard and tough. And um, uh, your your family suffered also a lot. Your family, your wife and children, because sometimes for two, three, four days you would ne you would never get home, and when you get home, the family was sleeping, and when you leave, they were sleeping. Um, so and there was no cell phones those days. You couldn't phone, 
and found out, found out what was going on. Uh, at one stage, it was so rough and tough, they, they came to put a police radio base into my house so that I didn't have to drive out to at 100, 200 kilometers an hour to Tembisa to solve a problem there and from there to Cat Long so I could get onto the radio in my house, speak to the people on the ground, give instructions and, and wait for, for, for feedback without driving around and up and down and from one scene to the other scene. And uh, yeah, we had a couple of close shapes um, the way we really, with, with, with the grace of God, survived. Um, a lot of more people could have gotten killed. Um, I had some guys that were thrown with a petrol bomb in a Casper um, that was burned badly. And yeah, uh, like I said, it was, it was a tough start. And uh, every unit had its own reaction team uh, that we uh, used to uh, that used to do house clearing, what we call the house clearing. We would get uh, the, the the security branch would task you to go and do house clearing on a house with suspects in it. Uh, so we would hit the house, uh, make it safe, arrest who needed to be arrested. Then the security branch would go in and and search and do whatever they need to do. Uh, I was actually with the day when uh, we arrested Robert McBride in Alra Park outside Nigel. Uh, so that was also part of our duties. We did all this house clearing for, for, for like the security branch for like murder and robbery when they had robbers uh, that they wanted to arrest. So we were specially trained in this house clearing. And that's where we also did a lot of specialized training with a special railway special start, special task force. Uh, we did this on a weekly basis, all the house clearing and Abseiling out of choppers and uh, fast roping out of choppers. Uh, yeah, we did a lot of, lot of, lot of training. We were, we had a very, very well trained team. And these two women that I wanted to tell you came with a eighty uh, six group, and they insisted to go to the farm for six weeks with the guys. And they actually passed the course. They, by hell or high water, they passed the course. Um, they, they were really, they were really, uh, I've got these stories that's in my book that I'm busy uh, writing um, and I gave everyone a chance to write their own story. And she actually wrote her story uh, of how they suffered and how hard it was, but they ground their teeth, but they did, and they passed the course. They really passed the course. They did everything that was expected of them. And it was really not a uh, Mickey Mouse kind of thing. It was really, really, really tough. The, uh, the only thing that happened is they were allowed to sleep inside the farmhouse and not outside, where the two instructors could keep an eye on them. Yeah, that's basically uh, the, 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 the main thing. Of course, um, uh, like I say, um, uh, uh, the police never knew how the army operated, and the army couldn't understand that two guys in the police van represented the police. And the police in the police van couldn't understand that there's 10, 10 uh, soldiers with a corporal and a one pup loot, and, and, and that was how they operated. And because of the, the because of my training and my period on the army base in, in uh, Wamboland, uh, I, I, I was that was my stepping stone to know exactly how they operated, and I could tell the police. And everybody, listen. This is how the police. This is how the army operate. And I could tell the uh, the, the, the defense force guys. This is how the police operate. And like I say, um, I, I, I had very, 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 very good relationships with 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 uh, with all the personnel from the army that I spent time with in the townships and on all the meetings and all the uh, uh, what they used to call this. Uh, uh, we used to call them the Gesamentlik Operatie Centrums, a mutual, mutual operational center meetings where all the brigadiers and all the people from security branch and, and the army and everybody was present. And then they would discuss the situation and plan for the for the future and plan for the next week. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, that's uh, that was part of our duties as well. And that's where I, I had a very, very lot of close relationships with the, with the army. Yeah, it's true, sir. Thank you for telling us these things. I, I find it fascinating. I've been making notes here like you can't believe. All sorts of memories coming back as you speak. 
I know just a little bit. He speaks very well of you. Uh, the paratrooper apparently worked with you at uh, Alexandra or something. Yeah, uh, 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 I think he's a brigadier general, um, Alexander. Yes, Alexander. Yeah, very, very. Uh, yeah, he's a, he was he was an excellent, excellent, excellent uh, person to work with. I uh, worked with him in Alexandra. Um, but we also had uh, one of the problems that uh, I had as a commanding officer at some stages in my life is was I was was outranked but not outknowledged, if you would understand what I say. Uh, and that was uh, that was a frustrating frustrating thing for me because um, I, I really specialized in in, in 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 urban terrorism and riots. That was that was my that was my speciality. And then you you get people that outrank you and want to give you uh, instructions on how to do the job. And then you tell them this it can't be done like that. It's going to end up in a disaster. And then they would tell you, look, I'm Brigadier so-and-so and you, Colonel, so you do what I say needs to be done. And then when it backfires, uh, then they tramp water. Um, uh, that, that's what, It's a big frustration. And I think even for today's policemen, there's very good cops that's sitting in the same rank at 25 and 30 years that's got all the knowledge and then they must be commanded by people that outrank them but don't outknowledge them and that that's a very frustrating situation to be i was there in 1986 in the college that's when i graduated i'm much younger than you of course and i remember 86 was a bit of a strange year in the college because we would be going to uh, riots actually they would grab us out of a college and all of us had that three week course at Maniuskop or at uh, Bedrock which consisted of shooting and running and uh, tear gas, lots of tear gas, things like that so those young men who arrived with you sir in 86 out, straight out of a college was that a good thing or a bad thing sir I mean could you train them then according to your will or were they lacking of experience and perhaps that was a problem as well yeah, look, uh, the, the training, I had a lot of guys that went to Maliuskov, from the college to Maliuskov for the three weeks, whatever, and came back. But uh, the, the basic training they got in Maliuskov was very good. I, did, I myself did a couple of uh, uh, courses in Maliuskov. I went to Verdrag. Uh, I was all over. I, I, I qualified myself as a, as a weapons instructor uh, outside the police. Uh, I was a National Firearm Training Association instructor. Uh, and I've got a lot of uh, weapons uh, training and, and I've, like I showed you, I've got a lot of uh, diplomas and stuff that uh, that I uh, obtained outside the police uh, to be able to, uh, because I, 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 I always believed uh, to, 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 to not tell somebody to do something that I couldn't do myself. Uh, but when we did anything we did on the unit, I was the first, I was the first down the building I was the first out of whatever, first out of the chopper. Um, uh, I, I would never give a guy uh, instruction to do something that I didn't do myself or wouldn't do myself. Um, uh, and it was very difficult with this 120 youngsters. You know, they were 18 and 19 year old old guys. And, and now you can imagine yourself. He came from a Luskop. Now he was learned a lot of things, like you say, tear gas and whatever. And um, then. To send them directly into a place like Catlong was disastrous. So I, I, I tried, I, I had to send some of them, obviously I had to send some of them directly, but most of them I sent to the farm for the six weeks course, uh, our six weeks course, because we specialized, we knew what was happening in the townships and we knew what to do. And uh, that's what we learned them. We prepared them very well to do their task in the townships. Uh, but it was it's difficult uh, to sit with 120, 19, 20 years old guys. And then obviously uh, I had a lot of them that came from places like Durban and uh, they've never seen a mine dump in their lives. They, they want to see, they want to see the, the, the sea. And that's part of their life. They want to look out of the window. They want to go down to go do surfboarding and whatever. And the next minute he lands up in a place like the Nota. And uh, there's, there's, there's the only water there is dam water and blaze box spread. Uh, so a lot of them was, was, was very negative, uh, but eventually they, they adapted and some of them I helped to get back to Durban. Uh, because, I, you know, it's, it's, it's better 
to work with 10 positive people than to, uh, with 20 people which half is, 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 is negative. Uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather work with a guy that wants to be there than a guy that's forced to be there. You understand what I say there? It's, it's difficult. And obviously, they were naughty. They were naughty bosses. Yes, they were. Um, they were, would visit the, the close by the Noto Hotel and, and they were getting involved in fights and, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the normal, the normal kind of stuff. And uh, it was actually uh, myself and my two IC, Pete Roski. Uh, we actually, Monday mornings when we went to the office, uh, the, the CID from the Donato police station would, standing, would be standing on the stoop waiting for us with a couple of dockets. And then I would say, okay, Andres, come in and tell me what happened this weekend. Now they broke glasses here and they broke windows there. And and uh, then we negotiated to, to to pay for the damage out of the tea club and uh, the things would have been squashed then. But yeah, but... Uh, the, the only, the only, uh, we were very, I was very strict on fitness. Uh, people had to do a fitness test every month. Uh, I built an obstacle course on the unit. Um, so uh, we were very, 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 I was very, very, fitness and discipline was, was two things that wasn't negotiated with me. And when a guy uh, stepped out of the line, I would send him on a two week uh, PT course. He would uh, run for two weeks uh, every day. And then, uh, yeah, that helped a lot. Uh, I was I was in a situation where I could rather give, instead of defaulting a guy and giving him a bad record, I would rather put him on a two-week PT course and run the hell out of him and all this nonsense. Uh, and and that, uh, that that's how we operated. And we had uh, our own mess. Luckily, we had our own mess and our own canteen. And then uh, at one stage, we, uh, we had some, we did some, uh, father and son courses, and we earned money, and I built a swimming pool for the guys at the unit, um, for for so, so that they had some entertainment there. Yeah, so we uh, we we really uh, we really had a good team. I had a good unit, uh, but we had your bad spots. But mm, I could say ninety percent plus of my guys were very good guys, dedicated guys, um, and and uh, I was a no nonsense guy. Um, I, 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 he was a uh, when the 120 guys, the day when they arrived at the unit, obviously a lot of the mothers and fathers came with them because they came directly from the college. And I gave my speech and uh, we laughed about it afterwards. They will still tell you today that part of my speech was the following. I said to them, listen, um, uh, you, you don't have to drink uh, or get drunk to show your fellow people or your girlfriends or whatever that you're out of the school now. Rather grow a moustache and they can see you finish with school. And if you, if you haven't got a moustache, clock into my house half past five tomorrow morning and come and drink my shaving water. Uh, and, and that was, that was, uh, <laughs> and we I actually will tell you that same story after, to, till today they will tell you that story. Um, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was because I, I was a non-drinker my whole life. I never had a problem with somebody that that drink. They had their own canteen, and the guys had a snooker table there, and that was their uh, way of getting rid of all the stress and the problems. They used to go to the canteen and enjoy themselves. Uh, but they, there was one rule: if I phone you tomorrow morning two o'clock and you're intoxicated, stay home. Don't come to work. Don't come to work. Rather stay home. Take the punishment that will come the next day. But if you end up there drunk, you will definitely get a hiding, a physical hiding. So stay away from me when you're drunk. They, they knew that. That was part of it. That was not negotiable. Yeah, the riot unit sir, was one of the most militarized, I suppose, units in the entire police. Uh, you were functioning like a military. You had platoons, you had sections, you had companies armored vehicles, things like that. Uh, was it totally different from the normal police? Yeah, it looked the, the normal police uh, had the normal police duties. They did complaints and uh, um, the normal visited accidents and uh, murder scenes and uh, assault scenes and things like that. And they were specialized units. You know, there was some up was in operating a murder and a robbery, the vehicle branch. So there were specialized units, which was the biggest 
balls up they ever made was to disband all these specialized units. That was the, the, the most horrible thing they ever did because he's, they were, I mean, like Brixton murder and robbery, the East Rand murder and robbery, Durban, Cape Town, all these murder and robbery teams were, were excellent in what they were doing. The vehicle branches were operating excellent. Sunup was, sun was on top of, of everything. So uh, why they disband these uh, uh, specialized units, that was Celebi, that, that, that was the biggest, biggest balls up they ever did. And one other thing, my personal view, one other thing they should have never done, they should never have amalgamated the railway police with the South African police. That was a big, big, big mistake uh, in hindsight and in my opinion, because the railways was functioning properly, all the stations were functioned properly. They had an excellent uh, special task force uh, that could handle any anything on any airport, on any coast. Uh, they were really excellent, excellent, excellent people. Uh, I did a lot of training with them. I spent a lot of time with them. They were they were really very, very, very well trained. And uh, uh, what happened when they amalgamated, uh, I mean, they disappeared, like you put a, a drop of uh, color into a bucket of water. It dissolved and it was gone. And what happened now is look at the stations. The stations are all demolished. I went to Benoni Station yesterday. It's only the pieces of rubble that's standing there. And the sad part that it's, just, it's, it's right next to the police station. And they can't show, tell me of one arrest that was ever made of anything they demolished there. The vehicle branch in Benoni, where the old Benoni police station is, is demolished. It's it's vandalized. Uh, it's, it's, it's terrible. The, the whole railway system is non-functional. And when the railway police was, was, was uh, involved, uh, you could go to any railway station, you could get onto any train, everything was functional. Uh, that was a big, big, big mistake. Uh, my opinion, uh, to, to amalgamate the, the, the railway police with the, with the South African police. Really, really big mistake. I have to agree with you, so it was, it, they didn't think it through. No, that, that was, I, I don't think, I can't think what, what motivated them to do that. Because uh, the, this, the, there was a functional system, a workable system, uh, the, the, the Task force was well trained. Uh, the, the railway police on all, on every station there was railway police, and they, and and everything was functioning. And now it's non-functional. The whole railway system is down the drain. You can't you can't drive on it. You can't go on a train anymore. My, my, my brother, one of my brothers, came on a on one of these so-called trains from uh, Cape Town to Johannesburg. And uh, he said it was the worst thing ever. He would never, if it wasn't a prepaid thing that was done a year or two ahead, he wouldn't have never, if he knew then what he knew, that he would have never gotten onto that train. At some stages, they, they were standing like three, four hours at one place. And I had to go pick him up in Jimmiston. Uh, they couldn't, uh, they, they, they couldn't, uh, they had to uh, take him from the trains onto buses to take them to other uh, to other destinies. It's, it's, it's horrible to see the stations. I promise you, you can, I live in Springs. Pollock Park Station is only part of the walls that's left there. Benoni Station, Boxburg East Station, um, stations in Porch, they, they, they're all demolished, non-existent. And it was functional when the railway police were there. Yeah, that's true. We, they, they... They were there. It was a very neat unit. It was a very specialized unit. I spoke to some of them. It will still be broadcasted. Uh, their uh, task force, their special task force. It got Colonel Andre Willifier was already on. Uh, yes. I believe the point of view. Oh, they, yeah. and, and they had excellent, excellent training. I mean, the, I've yeah. got training through them because they were trained in, in, in the, uh, Germany and in Israel. Uh, I was lucky enough to get some of that training because I amalgamated with him. We did mutual training um, uh, with Johan Lottry. I just one day decided, uh, Johan will tell you the story if you have an interview with him. I just one day decided that's it. Uh, they were based in Kempton Park. I was in, based in Benoni. I got into my car. I drove there. I walked in there. And I said, I'm Ian Killian. I said, I'm Johan Lottry. We were both captains then. I said, and I said to him, I think it's time we start working together. And that's how we started working together. 
Um, we did a lot of, lot of training together. We, we are friends up till today, myself and Johan Lottery. I'm friends with Andre Olivier. Uh, Andre was also an excellent, excellent uh, person, an excellent policeman, uh, very well trained. Um, he was he's an excellent person. Philip Skitter, there's a lot of them. I'm Crocker. Uh, they, there's very, very well trained guys that you would you could go to war with them any day, to hell and back with them. I would uh, really, even till, even today, I would go with, with those guys into any, any situation. I'm going to ask you perhaps a strange question, sir, because we have to remember at Legacy, there's a lot of people who don't remember those days, or we were perhaps too young, or they don't know about it. But why did you need the skills of a special task force, whether it be the railway police or the South African one? Why did the unit need those skills? Look, um, you need special skills for a simple reason. You can think for yourself, go into a squatter's camp to go and arrest a person. Uh, they, uh, if you shoot through in a squatter's camp, uh, that, that, it's so close to each other uh, and they, there's nothing to protect you. So you, you, you use special skills to do like house clearing, for instance. Um, you, you, need this, you need your weapon handling. You need how to... You, you need, you know, we, we were specializing in weapons and uh, we used to start off with, uh, we could, uh, the guys on the unit could blind, you could blindfold them, they could strip and assemble their weapons. Uh, that's how well they knew their weapons. Uh, because uh, your weapon was, was, was your, your weapon was your, 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 uh, your comfort, it was your self-defense um, uh, and, and uh, the, the weapon stood between you, between life and death. And, and that's, you need special skills. Uh, you, you had to do like fast roping out of choppers. If you need to put 10 guys on the ground in 10 seconds, you could do it with our chopper and we were fast roping. Uh, 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 we did a lot of abseiling from buildings. So you, you need, you, because of the urban terrorism situation that was going, I mean, you had to go and arrest a person that would, could be lying in bed with a hand grenade with a AK-47. So uh, you, uh, time and training and weapon training was very, very essential to do the job. Um, you, without that, you would have been dead. Uh, I, will, I will one day read you the story that uh, one, of, uh, one of my guys, uh, he wrote the story. Uh, he was one of my reaction, reaction unit uh, leaders. Uh, uh, they would get the task, six or so seven of them, to go and clear a house for the security bronze. And you, you go to that house with the knowledge there might be two or three terrorists inside, uh, guys with weapons, uh, uh, armed robbers. So that's how you approach the situation. And if you haven't got the specialized skills, you can't do the job. You will die. You can't go there and go and kick open a door and rush in and, and think uh, you're going to... Uh, get out of it scot-free. Yeah, there's certain techniques that you do, certain ways you enter, people uh, backing each other. Uh, it's, 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 you need that specialized training. Can you tell us That's why it's called a special task force, a special task force, because they do special training. Uh, and it, it, it's just a specialized situation. It's not a, in every normal policeman's cup of tea to go to a house to go and arrest a, a, a so-called robber or a so-called terrorist a terrorist inside the house. You don't know what's waiting inside. You approach every situation as if it's the worst situation. If it's not, it's, it's your, to your benefit. If it, if it does happen, you're prepared for it. You know, so sometimes in a flying squad, a dark unit, we would get to a house where there's some problems there and, there and we would walk into a hostage type of situation and standing orders told us we have to back up and call the special task force but many times sir, we would intervene ourselves because we had no time time to wait and then the special task force people god bless us all would be very very upset <laughs> he would not be happy about that but it's really a matter of a guy looks like he's going to start shooting so it's better for you to shoot him first now yeah were there any type of clashes between the commanders of Unit 6 and say the Special Task Force or people who think that you were intervening perhaps? On no, the no, I never, I, 
myself and uh, the, the then task force uh, um, uh, CEO was uh, Blackjack the Swart, you know, Blackjack the Swart. Um, we, are, we are still, like I can say, friends today. Uh, I did a lot of training with them and uh, we never had any problems. Um, guys like Mike Fryer and myself, we got along very well. Uh, Tini Stradom, uh, but we did uh, rescue. Uh, 1988, we went down to Uppington uh, on, the, on the rescue teams there. Uh, Tini Stradom was in a major. I was a captain. He was in charge of the of, of the whole operation there. So we did a lot of mutual work together. We never had, I never had problems with the task force. Never, ever. There was no uh, no problems with me and the task force and, and the special task force of the railway police. Like I say, we got along very well. Uh, I had no problems with 3-2 Battalion, um, uh, with, with, with Space Forces in, 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 uh, in, in Pretoria, with the Army. Uh, I got along with those people. I never had problems with them. With the murder and robbery, I did a lot of work with murder and robbery, with, uh, with, with, with Sunup. We, we used to assist Sunup. We used to assist the vehicle branch. No, I, I never had any, any, any problems with, with, with any of the commanding officers whatsoever. I mean, uh, you can go and look there on my wall the uh, the commendations I got from from the army. I mean, that that, that would show you uh, the, the the mutual work. Uh, and and if you read what stands on it, is because of the 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 work that we did together, and and we improved the image of the army because of the work that was done between us. May I ask you, Colonel, what happened to a free two battalion at that incident? Uh, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a hot sauce story. Three to battalion was, um, you know, like uh, they were disbanded, and um, uh, it was it's, uh, there was uh, there was a lot of hard working guys at three to battalion. Look, they were they were they, they came from the war. They came from 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 Bomberland and those places, and they were in Angola, and and they were Portuguese speaking, obviously. Uh, but uh, uh, I had. Uh, myself and uh, the CEOs like uh, Tinas van Staden, uh, who was in charge of them while they were operating here, um, we had very, very good relations uh, to such an extent that one, uh, in, well, let me just tell you how, they, how good these guys were. Uh, at one stage, uh, we uh, got instructions to put barbed wire right around the hostels to keep them inside the hostels and to keep people from entering the hostels. And it's three coils of barbed wire. It's a very difficult kind of thing to do. So we would, every day we would do a couple of kilometers to go around the hostels. And uh, then the commanding officer would come to me when we chile up, like five or six o'clock at night. He said, I must give him the key to the storeroom. And then he would take his three, two battalion guys, which was, wasn't allowed. And they would, the next day when we came there, they would have covered the whole area at night with a barbed wire. Um, in the in the midst of the night, they would do the things that they weren't allowed to do because they weren't allowed to do that police work. That was done by the police because the police were always always in charge. The army was also uh, they were all, always on on the secondary on the secondary kind of uh, helping force, and the police was also all, always in charge. So that that's why uh, on every army vehicle when they patrolled in the township, there was a warrant officer of the police on the army vehicle. So he was, when they arrested somebody, he was the guy that did the arrest and he was the guy that did the paperwork and had to go to court. The army just gave him the necessary support to, to do whatever was needed to do. So do you think sir, that Free to Battalion was set up when they started shooting that day? Uh, look, they investigated the whole thing there. Um, I don't know actually what, I didn't read the actual report. But um, um, uh, there was, uh, they wanted to make it a one-sided thing always. Like when uh, they shot at uh, Unit 19 from, from Tecosa, um, it was always a one-sided thing. They did nothing. The police just stormed in there and started shooting. I mean, which is ridiculous. I mean, uh, I was there. I was on the ground there. We never went into places and just started shooting at random to people. Uh, but we actually, I actually one day drove into a fighting faction where two factions were shooting at each other, and I was in the middle with this, with my with my police car, 
uh, and we we this we, we got out of the car myself and my my, my the sergeant that was with me he later he later became a colonel and took over the unit uh, later years and at one stage we were lying on the ground and the bullets were flying right across us and and, and over us and into the into the hostel the, the the plaster actually fell onto my car as the bullets hit the plaster and at one stage i said to him look now we gotta get out of here he got into the car and i reversed like you haven't seen a car reverse. I think Saul von Amaro would have been under the dashboard when he was in that car. But we got out of it, and then we went and got into Caspers and came back, and and and, 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 and we arrested a couple of these guys. They were running, shooting with AKs. Uh, but we never, ever saw that people for no reason. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I negotiated to get uh, people to, to, to stop killing each other. So why would we start putting a, fly, a, a, a match into the fire. doesn't make sense. And, and then there's, there was a so-called third force uh, allegations. The third force. I've never met the third force. I never met them there. I was there every day of my life in the townships. Um, there was no third force. I mean, uh, there was the ANC on the one side and IFP on the other side. And then later on, the civics came in. And then the... the the Free Mandela campaign started in the 80s and the UDM was established. Um, so there was a, a lot of things and people that really, I mean, the ANC fought each other. I will tell you this quickly. There was two camps, the Woody Mandela camp and another camp. And uh, the, the Red Cross gave some portable toilets to the one camp, but were both with ANC camps. And at, at night, this one camp stole two of the portable toilets from the other camp. And they actually killed these people. I, I picked up this guy, the, the, the guy that was involved in stealing the portable toilets. Uh, we picked him up. This, is, this was a guy that was beheaded. His chest was cut open. They put a piece out of his heart. He was castrated. His feet was chopped off. And then Chris Honey visited. He came the next day. I met Chris Honey. And he went to speak to the people to settle the problem. I actually had a, a three coils of barbed wire between the two ANC camps. And I mean, they killed each other for portable toilets. And Chris Honey, the day that the day arrived there, and he negotiated and started talking with the people and uh, tried to settle the dispute between the two of them. That's how bad it was at one stage. You... ANC on ANC, never mind IFP. There was a story, sir. Uh that the police were not neutral, that they were on the side of IFP and down in Kailicha on the yeah, no, no. I, but, I will tell you, that's, I, I was, <laughs> what happened there is the same thing that happened at uh, at Marikarna. Um, they, it was two copies, they just outside Katlong. On the one copy was sitting a lot of ANC, uh, and on the other side was IFP people. They Those days they wore, the uh, IFP had red, Bands on their heads or on their arms, and the ANC guys white. So I sent my two Caspers and I said, Go and get me the negotiator from the one team and the negotiator from the IFP team. They actually did go there. They picked up two people on the one copy and two people on the other copy, and they came back. And I've got it was actually on the front page of the citizen where I negotiated with these two teams. And I said to him, Listen, you're going to stop these problems. You're going to leave all your weapons there. Otherwise, I'm going to keep you on those copies for the next three days. And 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 in some instances, I, I really did that. I kept people there for two, three days, and then they they came back and begged me to to come out. And then I said, okay, leave your weapons, single file, then you come out, because then all the booze was out. That they were hungry uh, and they were thirsty, uh, and without firing one single shot. You resolve the whole dispute. But what happened that day is we sent the two Caspers, and there was also photographers and people from the press, which we didn't know. They were hiding around. And they we picked up the two uh, negotiators, the negotiators came back, and then I sent them back afterwards. But they only took pictures of us taking the Inkata people back. They, 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 they edited the, the video. And that landed up on SABC that night. The police is partial. We are supporting the, the Inkata. 
And then luckily, a day before that happened, we got new cameras. And one of my guys was taking pictures of this whole situation, where the two Caspers were driving, where we picked them up, where they came back. And uh, the minister phoned me, Adrian Flock phoned me, and said, what the hell is happening here? The, the, they've got proof here that we're now supporting the IFP. I said, no, no, no. And they actually developed that pictures the whole night, the, the, the fingerprint department. And the next morning, I was in Pretoria with Adrian Flock and um, Jill Marcos from the ANC. And a lot of people were there, and they were showing this video. And they said to the minister, yeah, look, look there. You see, you people are biased. And I said, no, no, no. And I had this whole photograph, photograph, all these photographs in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, um, um, in an album, a photo album. And I, and I, we showed them exactly where they edited the video, where the two Caspers were driving. I said, there's the two Caspers. There you've taken it, where we uh, went back to drop off the IFP and they edited it where we dropped off the ANC. And that, that got us off the hook because it was big, big, big on the newspapers how biased the police were and we were IFP supporters. And they had the same thing in, in, uh, in, in the Unit 5 uh, with that, uh, that big massacre that was there at, uh, what is the place, uh, Boy Patong. It was the same thing in Boy Patong. They also accused the police of being biased and, 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 and actually, uh, they actually said the police armed gave firearms to the to the to the Inkata people, which was later found to be untrue. Did they ever apologize, sir? No, they never apologized. Obviously not. Then they said, how can we say the people of the white bands were ANC? Said, well, they they were in a different group. <laughs> and that's uh, and by the way, that's uh, that was that uh, the, the the massacre they had in 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 uh, um, in, in the Rustenburg, um, what's the name of the place in Rustenburg? Maricana. Mar uh, yeah, Maricana. In Maricana, they all they uh, they would they could have done there. They could have maintained the people there for another day or two, and they would have come out themselves in single file. Because I, I've been, I've, I've had situations like that. You know, when they when they gather on the copy. Uh, their stomachs is full, half of them is intoxicated, uh, some of them is uh, uh, in them, and whatever, so they're brave, and they've got some firearms with them, you know. Uh, the, the sad part about that Marikana thing is they never mentioned the cops that was killed there, and the two security guards that was killed before before that massacre. Uh, they they co commemorate this every year, but they never commemorate the policemen and the police and the, and the security people that was killed there. And all they could have done there is they could have maintained them on that copy for another day or two, and they would have begged to come down. Because there's no water, there's no food, they are thirsty, they want to eat. Then you tell them, leave your weapons, you come out one by one. And uh, they, they could have resolved that thing in that manner. That's what I would have done if I was on that scene. So I must ask you about your black members, uh, your black policemen on the year, because I recall them having to flee with townships and having to live in the rugby fields at the, uh, of the police stations because they were not safe in the townships anymore, the black policemen. And I also remember rumors of witchcraft being used against them as black members. Have you ever in encountered such things, sir? No, what I did uh, encounter was that uh, black policemen, black policemen that was, was, was uh, uh, targets, uh, they threw hand grenades in their houses. Um, I, 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 I've not, I know one of the policemen personally, but my members, uh, my members stayed in uh, Daviton, and 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 we never had any problems. I mean, um, I had an open door policy those days. If I had meetings on a Monday morning, my black warrant officer, my black sergeants were in the office with the, all the other guys. Uh, I've, I've never had any problems with 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 my with my black. Uh, okay, I had some black people, same as white people, that wasn't supposed to be on the unit. I got rid of them. But uh, some of them, like uh, uh, Ndingi, uh, later became a colonel in Daviton, uh, Johannes Maslangu, uh, he retired. He stayed years after I left. He, st he stayed there. 
and uh, I can I can call any one of those days one of those guys today, uh, and, and and they will still respect me for being their commanding officer, because uh, we treated them the same as the white guys. So they got the same t- treatment, uh, the same training. Um, I mean, uh, when we ran, we ran in a, everybody the, the same fitness. Uh, we went through the same same turmoil. Uh, no, I've, I've never had any problems with black people on my unit, ever. Um, uh, they respected me, I respected them, and, and I could uh, I could press on their buttons, they were there for us. Can you tell us uh, about Winnie Mandela soccer team? Because some people might think this is just a normal soccer team, but it wasn't. No, 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 no. What happened is we had a, we had a, a funeral in Catlong, and that was in 1987, 89, when the Emergency Act was declared. And uh, they contacted me in the shop and they said, Winnie Mandela and a soccer team was driving around in Catalan. And I said, well, take them to the base. We landed there. And I, uh, I always carried all my stuff in a briefcase. And I said to her, look, according to the Emergency Act, you're not allowed to be here. I introduced myself, first of all. And, you know, we had our names on our camouflage. She says, you could see my surname, Gilliam, there. Um, she uh, later on when we picked her up with Nelson Mandela, she recognized me. She didn't even want to greet me. Uh, Nelson Mandela greeted me, but she refused to greet me because she recognized me, obviously because of my mustache and my name. Um, but uh, then I said to her, look, according to the emergency act, you, you and your soccer team are not allowed to be here. You need a permit to be here. And this uh, a daughter, Zinzi, was with as well. She actually swore the hell out of us. Uh, she effed us and F you and whatever, uh, but uh, she, uh, you could see the, the the soccer team. They knew they were outnumbered. They weren't. They, they're going to get a. If they tried anything there, they would have been arrested straight away. Uh, so they actually waited for Winnie's instructions. And after I showed her the emergency uh, act, and I told her you need a permit to be here. And after she said to me, I would need a permit to walk around in the streets. If they, they take over. She pointed the finger at me, and then they left. They had no option but to leave. Uh, it, uh, it was a big defeat, I think, for her and the soccer team to to do drape start out of the townships. Um, yeah, that was my first meeting with her, and the, and then the second one was when I picked her, General Malone and Mr. Nelson Mandela up at the Cosa Police Station. Um, just to uh, to tell you in a lighter note. Uh, the reason why they landed there was because they reckoned the Koza Puri station, which was uh, uh, supposed to give uh, service to Polar Park, uh, never never did anything for Polar Park. And when they from Polar Park came to the Koza Puri station, they were chased away. So we walk into this Puri station, and behind the counter is this black sergeant, and he's so drunk he can't, can't get out of his seat. Now you must know is General Malone, Winnie Mandela, myself, and Mr. Nelson Mandela walking into this police station. And this sergeant is so drunk he can't get out of his seat. So, what's the first thing that Mr. Mandela said to General Malone? You see what I'm telling you, you police, this is your police. They're supposed to help my people in cut in Takosa. This is your police. So I had to get rid of him quickly, had him replaced. And then got them into the Casper and we drove around. And while we were actually driving, there was a body lying in front of the hostel. And we were going to a little shopping center. There was another body lying there. And they actually wanted to get out of the Casper. And I said to the general, no, no, no. You're not getting out of the Casper. If you get, you or anybody get shot here, it's going to be on me. Stay in the Casper. They could look. And then we took them back to the, to, to the chopper. And that was the goodbye and gone. I remember so there was a story that the yellow police caspers would get shot more than the camouflage one. Is there any truth in that? Uh, no, I, I don't. I, I haven't. Uh, I don't recall anything like that that happening. But what 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 was a big problem for us? They dig trenches, especially in the Duza. They dug trenches, and we hit those trenches with the caspers. And uh, that caused a lot of problems. Guys got injured inside the Casper because it was 
it was camel floss and it was yeah and it was it was deep and uh, and and some of them even emptied some some uh, uh, toilet buckets into these trenches so you hit this trench you got to get another casper to come and take it out and it is full of uh, full of crap and it stinks like hell and then at one stage they uh, you would remember at one stage they put some uh, a piece of um, pine on the caspers to cut wires because what they did the guys were sitting on the caspers were standing in the caspers and they would uh, get a wire from one pole to the other pole across the road and if you hit that thing on your head you would have been a beheaded um, so that, that was one of the things they did on the Caspers and later on they put those little roofs on the Caspers because they hold petrol bombs into the Caspers. I almost actually had this petrol bomb incident in David and where four of my guys got burnt with the petrol bomb that was held into a Casper. I made a statement the other day, sir, and I said that if you look at the counterinsurgency unit section, the way they armed, and if you look at the way a riot unit section is armed, then there's a very definite difference. Because the one at the counterinsurgency will have its R1s and the LMG, the MAG. Well, it was completely differently armed at the riot unit. You would have your shotguns, your stoppers, and perhaps one or two R1s. So my theory was that through the years, the riot units adapted to their specialist work. And it became actually more difficult for the riot unit to kill somebody than it would be for a section on the border where you just shoot to kill. You've got the ammunition and the rifle. Uh, what would you say about such a statement, sir? Now look, the, the, the war on the, on the border was a completely different war. They, if you saw the enemy, you could shoot the enemy. Uh, in the townships, you, you never knew who, where the enemy were. Uh, I mean, uh, it was the, there was no, there was no red flags. That's an enemy, or that's not an enemy. Uh, on the border, it was a very, very difficult, uh, a, a different situation. Those guys would get, and they found the spoor, and they followed the spoor, and they knew this was terrorists. This was insurgents, and uh, were being shot on sight. Uh, in the townships, uh, you had an invisible enemy. The, it was the guy sitting on the pavement. He could have been the biggest terrorist in the in the in the, in, in, the, in the township, but there was no there was no uh, ways that you could identify these people except if the security branch, because of the intel, found out that Mr. Pit Pomp is staying in sack number so and so uh, is actually a terrorist, and he's got a weapon and he's got that. Then you know, uh, obviously you would go there, and if you get the resistance and get fired on, you would have shoot you would have shot him. That's it. Uh, but uh, uh, you, it's an invisible enemy in the townships. You see this guy with a red band, you see in Kalta, the guy with a white band, it's ANC. But while they're walking the streets, they do nothing. Uh, you've got no reason to arrest them. It wasn't against the law to wear a, 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 a red armband or a white armband. But they, they, they never wore, the, wore it while being by themselves. In groups, they would do that. And it's the same on the trains. I mean, this guy walk into the train and the next minute is a train full of, a uh, coach full of ANC supporters. And this guy's got no uh, identification whatsoever. And they would ask him and they would talk to him and they would find out, but he's not one of them. And he would get stabbed and hold out of the train. And vice versa, this ANC supporter going to work, he's not actually carrying any identification, but gets into this IFP coach and the way they speak, they know exactly. Uh, it's not Zulu speaking. Most of the IFPs, those were Zulu guys, and the others were Kosar guys. And the next minute, he's dead and he's out of the train. I mean, at one morning, I think we picked up like forty-eight bodies uh, next to the railway lines, uh, and there was there was I think there was two pregnant women as well amongst them. Uh, that's the kind of thing you had to deal with. But you, as a policeman. I couldn't, I mean, I know a little bit of Zulu, I understand a bit of Zulu, because my father was on, uh, working on the mines and they used a language like, they call it Fanagalo, which is a mixture of a lot of languages. But I, I can understand a bit of Zulu and I know a couple of 
Zulu words and whatever. But if you're a Torza speaking person and a Zulu speaking person, Zulu speaking person, I would know exactly who is who. But you as a policeman don't know. You speak to this guy in English or your people speak to them in their language, um, uh, but uh, you can't identify them as, as being the enemy. And, and they weren't our enemies as such. They were enemies amongst each other. You must remember the ANC was fighting the IFP. The police wasn't involved in the fight. We were trying to separate the fighting. We were there to, to restore order. That was our duty. And, and, and to, to keep the peace there. And that's why I started negotiating with his people. With, and with a guy like Rupert Bloriba that, that, was, that, was, that was, the, was, was, was heading the, the, uh, the, the talks. Mr. Rupert Lorima. Um, uh, and, and I've got pictures I can show you where I fetched these people and, and started talking and said, Look, you can't carry on like this. You can't kill innocent people. Um, and, and at one stage, I went to the one hostel in Fosluris and uh, I wanted to speak to the Induna because every day we picked up bodies that passed the, 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 the hostel. And I, I felt that day like Peter Thief because I was, I, I was forced to leave my nine millimeter behind. And Duna said, I can come in, but without a weapon. So I had my guys park the Casper so they could actually see me walking in there. And, and the Zulus are very disciplined people, that I can tell you. That Duna just said, Slala Panzi, Slala Panzi, everybody sat down and nobody spoke. You could hear, you could hear a pin drop. And then I said to him, listen, this is the end of people, myself, picking up bodies outside. The next body I pick up outside, I clean out this hostel or I keep you maintained in this hostel. Nobody will come out and nobody will come in. And that, that was what, uh, what, we, what we discussed. And that was also the end of the, uh, picking our bodies outside the hostel every day. I want to ask so you the, about the, 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 the story that the police were supporting the IFP or supporting whatever. The police, and we never supported any of the groups. I mean, what reason did we have to support it? We wanted to maintain peace. And the hostel dwellers was actually uh, more vulnerable than anything else because they were staying in a hostel and they, uh, they were in a certain area. The rest of the township belonged to the rest of the people. And there was even Zulu people, Zulu-speaking people, uh, ex-hostel people that got married with people in the township that stayed in the township with their families. And some of them were, became targets because of this in fighting between the IFP and, the, and, and Ikata. And we actually had roadblocks on the highway there at Fosluris, you know, that highway coming down from Durban. And, and we actually stopped some combis there, um, three, four, five combis full of Zulus coming to, 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 uh, to support their buddies in the hostels. So that's, that's what that was what's going on. Not the police that was involved. I mean, uh, why would we get involved in supporting some of them? Oh, that's a good question, sir. But I have to ask you, because we find in Europe, we find a lot of no-go areas where the local police are simply too scared to go into. They're all a bunch of wankers, if you ask me. So, so were there any no-go areas where your unit would be feared? Would be Never. We, we went everywhere. We went everywhere. We, there was no no-go areas for me. Uh, no, nobody stopped me from going anywhere. Never, never. If we wanted to go into, we went into hostels, into hostels, in the inside of hostels. We went, uh, we went foot patrol and, and, and vehicle patrols in areas, I mean, in, in places like Alexandra, where I worked, uh, uh, where, where there was problems, I would put, I would close off. The first thing I would, I did at townships, I closed off the entrances. Nobody came in, nobody came out. And then you put foot and vehicle patrols supporting each other from, one state, one place to the other place to the other place uh, to, to maintain order. Uh, uh, and that's what worked. And, 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 and then you show, show like uh, uh, force, uh, a vehicle force. We would get the rattles and a lot of army vehicles and we would go through the township in a, in a parade, sort of a parade. And they would see all these rattles and, and, and buffles and whatever and police vehicles and, it would, and choppers in the air and would look like a, a, a war invasion and that would quiet down the whole township. Uh, they, they never knew what would hit them next. And then one of the things, uh, 
you you learn you learn if you work in the townships you learn the townships you could if you I, I used to drive into the township and then I would know today we're going to have problems by simple things that you that you pick up that you read there's there's no, there's no there's nobody selling any food uh, there's there's no pedestrians walking around and then you know there's something going on in the, these civics would go to the to the to the the people in the townships and force them to to get into uh, to, to, to to get into the parades and they would force them to give them petrol to make petrol bombs uh, those 16 17 18 15 14 year olds they would end up at 20 at one house and force the guy to give them money to give them petrol out of his car uh, and, and 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 they just abide by it because they had no option, they had no choice. But you could read the township. If the, the, the woman was there selling her millies and the other one selling a fed cook and people walking around and playing soccer, you know today's going to be a quiet day. You know, there's not going to be any problems. But on the other hand, within seconds, it can change. Within seconds, it can change. One guy can get an argument or walk past a hostel, get stabbed with a knife, the next minute, there's fighting going on. But you learn to read the, to read the, 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 the signs in the townships. Looking back, sir, what would have happened if Unit 6 and the rest of the riot units did not exist? If this was left like just for police stations? What if would the have riot units? Did not exist. If, if there was no riot units, that would have been a bloodbath. I mean, it would have been a bloodbath for, for sure. If uh, the riot, that's why I say every guy on a riot unit deserves a medal. Uh, but because we maintain the order and the structures in the townships, uh, if this escalated outside the townships into the into the uh, residential areas, it would have been a massacre, a bloodbath. But, uh, that's why some people were sleeping at night. They didn't even know what was going on. I mean, I can say, I mean, if you tell people today, I was sitting with 512 bodies, they think you're crazy. If you tell them there was a car bomb in Benoni, what car bomb? Where in Benoni? Everybody knows about the car bomb in Pretoria. If you tell them about the limpet mine that exploded in Benoni, uh, when, where, 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 where did this happen? I mean, that plane that went into that factory in, in, in El Road uh, that exploded there, uh, you tell them things like that, uh, they think you're crazy. What, what are you talking about? We never knew things like that happened. You tell them you picked up like 89 bodies one morning. Uh, where? Uh, what? 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 There? When did this happen? People, people were dreaming around in, in the 80s while we were fighting. I mean, I went to, the couple of times. I went to church. Uh, I went to church with my with my camo uniform. Most of the times, I had to leave church to go fight riots or on my way they put on my, my camo and somebody else had to take my wife and my children home and we slept in the township sometimes next to the Bista police station we slept there sometimes for a week two weeks we would be sleeping in a tent next to the police station so um yeah the, if it, uh, the best thing that happened uh, is when they uh, when they started with the riot units, uh, the reaction later became riot units, and and um, and unit nineteen uh, was was really uh, a very very big. They worked right through the whole country, but they were our support uh, they, on on crucial times. Unit nineteen and other units. I mean, uh, a guy wrote a, a letter the other day on Facebook. He was from Kimberley from unit fifteen. And he just wrote a, uh, I'll actually send it to you. You can read it. Did he say, where he met me at the North Police Station? Those days I was, I was always training. Uh, and I actually, at one stage, I had two dumbbells in the back of my police car. So when there was a little bit of time, I someone would take a workout in the police station. And this guy, reckoned, uh, told his friend that uh, I, I, I was pumping my arm, arms too bar before I got, get to work every day. Um, because those days I was actually very, very, very fit and working hard with weights and uh, just to keep myself in a, in a good condition. And that's also uh, where I got the name, the nickname Rambo from, because um, at one of this after shooting, after shooting practices and whatever, I used to take the LMG 
which is a weapon that you lions shoot with. And I would shoot with it out of my hip uh, uh, just to, for a show for the people. And uh, then I got uh, the nickname Rambo because of that. Talking about nicknames, sir, why did the unit become known as the Dapper Dyson? The brave one. Uh, yeah, what happened, what happened is uh, we, uh, we, there was a woman, um, she went a bit off a rocker, and she, she drowned her one son in a bath tub. Uh, uh, Nine-year-old boy, she, she, the two boys were taking a bath. One was nine, one is 11. And she drowned the one, and the other one was too strong. He jumped out of the window, and she went to this Royal York building in Alberton, which is the highest building in Alberton. And she was standing on the top, and she wanted to jump off. So um, the, the district comment, the district uh, uh, detective officer, uh, he was then a major, uh, later become a general, Adrian uh, Della Rosa, and uh, the guy from murder and robbery and uh, the minister was on top of the roof trying to convince her to climb over the wall. And she and it was going on for hours. And every time they walked towards her, she would, she would push her away from the wall. She was standing on a little ledge like this, and it was like nine or ten stories down. And then they found us, and myself and a guy by the name of Gert van der Merwe, he passed away a couple of years back, two years back. We went, and I went out on this front balcony, and I could actually see her. I could actually see the woman standing there. It was just too high to touch her. So we decided to bind, bound ourselves with ropes inside this uh, flat, and then the plan was the next. I was going to pick him up on my shoulders, get on this little wall, and he would grab her. If we fall, uh, we will hang onto her and hopefully fall into this into this little stoop. Um, luckily, she didn't see us, and we we told the guys to keep her busy on the outside. So uh, I, I tied ourselves with the ropes. I picked him on my shoulders, and I got onto this little wall. And be, when she saw us, he grabbed her, and he grabbed the wall, and she couldn't jump. And they came running from the front, and they. Uh, pulled her over the little wall. And uh, it was a very, look, If I, 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 should, I, should, I will never do it today. They asked me to redo it now. I will refuse because it was, it was actually a very, uh, very, very, very dangerous thing that we did. And uh, then this uh, General De La Rosa, uh, he, he put a letter in so that we could get recommended into police orders or at least get a uh, medal or whatever and what we got in return for that was a letter for good work uh, for the good work we did but it, uh, it says there that uh, the bravery and the, and, and the excellent work we did uh, uh, was, was, was uh, improving not our own image but the police image so uh, we were very brave to do what we did and we should actually have gotten mentioned in in uh, in, in police orders uh, where they mention your name, but we didn't even get get to that. Uh, but that's besides the point. We did what we had to do. But after that, they called, we got, got this name of the Dapper Dyson because it, it, uh, we ended up in the newspaper the next day. The rescue of Mrs. Van der Asfeld. I've got the newspaper. I'll, I'll send it to you. And um, but it was laughable that week after that. Off-duty policeman rescued the guy uh, on a beachfront that was drunk. He took the guy out, and uh, he actually got a medal for bravery. <laughs> so it was actually no laughable. Was, yes. But uh, medals, medals never bothered me. I was never, never a guy that that was. Uh, 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 the job was my was my my, my main thing. Uh, my my work was everything. Uh, I never worried about getting medals or what. I got. A stack of letters, this thick, uh, of people thanking me for, for uh, lectures that I gave and training that I gave, and uh, we did a lot of training. I trained women in firearms. We trained children. Uh, at one stage, we had to train policemen's wives uh, in, in, in firearms. And uh, there's also an, a, another laughable story there. This uh, one policeman, I think, it was from Grootsley. He sent his wife there to come for the shooting course, and she actually came there with a revolver in a coat hanger. She didn't want to touch it. She had it in a coat hanger and the bullets in a cigarette box. 
and she was crying. And, she, uh, and, and I, I gave my instructions in the class, my classroom instructions and uh, the weapon handling inside the classroom. And then we went to the shooting range. But I never spoke to her. I just left her and put her in the back of the bus. And we did the shooting. And then I kept one instructor behind. And I sent everybody back because I had a bribe afterwards. And then I took her and I, and I spoke to her. And I told her how a weapon works. And eventually she took the weapon. And eventually I made her do some dry firing. And, and, and a couple of shots with the earmuffs on. She was very afraid. And eventually... Uh, she got into this firearm and we couldn't stay ahead loading this weapon. She started shooting and shooting and shooting. Eventually, she, we got back to the unit. She had a target with her, all down on her arm, and she was all smiles and telling, showing everybody a target and how good she could shoot. And, and she actually framed that target at the house. Her husband told me afterwards, he phoned me afterwards and he said, I can't believe what I see. I've been married to this woman for more than 20 years and she didn't even want to touch this weapon. And uh, uh, he was so thankful that I eventually convinced his wife to be able to use this weapon. I wonder, sir, if you can tell us about the book you're writing. Um, I started uh, before the tragedy that you know of struck me when I shot my wife. Um, uh, I was approached by Anna Marie, the, the same woman that wrote Eugene's book. And um, uh, we, she, we sort of wanted to write a book. Uh, I didn't want to write the book of myself personally. Uh, I will tell my own personal story in a book one day. But then I decided, I said, okay, we can write a book. Uh, this is, the, this is the, uh, uh, the rough edges of it. Um, the Oostrand Brand, you can see there, this Afrikaans version, the Oostrand Brand. And then uh, what I decided to do, I wanted to give the people that worked on the unit the opportunity to tell their stories. And that's what's going to be in the book. I'm going to give a little bit of background of, of myself. And then I've got a lot like this woman that was on the course. They, she, she wrote her story. I got on the reaction unit. Uh, the guy, uh, and, and then the other thing I forgot to mention, we had this investigate this this, uh, this, this uh, uh, CIDs that worked with us in the townships. They were, they were the guys that would mark the bodies, take pictures of the bodies, and uh, open the inquest docket. A guy by the name of Nick de Goede, him and his team also did very, very, very good work in the townships. Uh, they were all there. They were all there 24-7 helping us and doing all the paperwork and whatever they needed to do. Uh, but uh, he also wrote his story next to Goede. And so I gave everybody an opportunity to, to write their story of, of their days on the unit, how they worked on the unit, how they found the unit, and, 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 and what it did in their lives. A lot of people uh, went into the private sector, and they in touch with me still today, and they, they say that they want to thank me for the, for the stepping stone I gave them to become... Uh, uh, business people because of the discipline they, they got on the unit. At one stage, about 14 of my guys in the unit played for the police first rugby team. Uh, they were very, very, very fit. They played very good rugby and, and, and because of the fitness they, they received on the unit, they excelled and did very well on the, on, on the rugby teams. But then, yeah, that's why I started to write it. Um, and after Ayla got shot, I sort of just left it. Um, um, I wasn't interested in doing it anymore. But uh, I think I must, uh, I must now finish it because there was a lot of work done into it. Uh, I'm still waiting for a couple of stories. I got some stories uh, like yesterday, day for yesterday, of some of the people sent me some stories uh, that um, they want to uh, put into the book. Yeah, so uh, that covers obviously all the the newspaper clippings of the bodies that was found and uh, all the diving we did. And uh, uh, yeah, that covers a lot of things that, uh, that we did on the unit. And I think it's just uh, necessary for, for the people uh, that, that doesn't know anything about what happened in the 80s so they can actually see what, what really happened. And even people that lived in the 80s that was in the dream world, uh, they never, never knew about stuff like this.
Um, now, if you show people like that, they can't believe it. And that's people, and I mean that it's a lot of this stuff was newspaper headlines. You know, I wish to touch something which is a bit sad, very sad, in fact. And But I have to ask you, sir, because there's many people watching you who do know your life story. And I have to ask you about your late wife. If you can just tell us sir, what happened there. Yeah, I had a, I had a very, um, very, very, very excellent, beautiful, a good wife. Uh, she was one of those people that never saw something bad in anybody. If it, there was no ugly and bad people in her, in her world. And um, she, we, well, she had a foot operation and she was recovering from that. And then um, a week before she had to go and see the specialist for the final checkup, for the final checkup, um, uh, she decided she wanted to go and visit her sister in Stolbay down in the Cape um, because her sister was going to leave the country for two years. And um, she, she arrived there on the Sunday. And uh, the Monday evening, Monday night, they had a braai. And uh, they was, she, she and her sister used to sing. And she played piano and whatever. She played uh, piano in church as well. She was a very religious person. And um, she was busy. She, I spoke to her about 10 past 9 that evening. And then um, she was busy texting me a message when five um, bravos entered the premises there. And she never knew what hit her. The next minute, one shot was fired and she was killed instantly. And then they um, uh, hit her brother-in-law with a piece of concrete. He was unconscious. And her sister's uh, hands were tied behind her back. Legiments were torn out of her shoulder, and one guy that they invited to bribe with him because they had four flats on the premises as well. He was one of the tenants there. Um, they were all they all had masks on, so they were looking for money. They wanted money. They wanted money. They wanted money. And then uh, the sister untied herself and she ran down a cliff there. I don't know how she she survived it, but they found her and and they dragged her back and tied her hands behind her back again. And this one tenant, uh, the one guy's mask came off and he actually saw this guy the whole time. But to cut the long story short, they eventually left there with 40,000 rand, a couple of weapons and my brother's laws, uh, old Toyota Baki. Uh, then I was informed uh, half past 10 that night that she was killed and shot, which was uh, a very, 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 very bad story. Um, I then made an oath. I said, my wife's not going to become a number in this country. I will make sure that these people get caught, which I did. Uh, but uh, from the police side, it was an a, a uphill battle. I went down to Cape Town. I introduced myself to the investigating officer, uh, which is a very good guy, a colored sergeant, plain boy. Uh, but he had no help from his superiors. He, he had an uphill battle, but he did a very, very good job. I then um, used my uh, friend, Bushi Engelbrecht, who became an officer with me as a platform. And uh, we then hired a guy by the name of Michael Hills, also ex-policeman, to investigate this. Um, I, he was on the job for two weeks. And then we identified the people. Um, uh, then uh, gave this uh, intel to the police. Um, uh, they, they, they dragged their feet. Uh, I had to use my contacts again, Johan Boysen, uh, Johan Berger, Pussy Engelbrecht. He used people down that he knew down there and they had a sting operation and they then eventually arrested everybody. One guy was arrested in, in, in Stolbay and the other four were arrested in the Eastern Cape. Then the case started dragging, um, then COVID came, uh, the case was dragged and dragged, and, and then the, the judge got cancer. Uh, he nearly died when the case was 80% finished. Luckily, he didn't die, otherwise everything would have started, had to start from the beginning. And then after four years and six days, they were found guilty and got life sentences.
um, yeah, that's that's the and uh, she's now got one of those white crosses there on Lumpur on that mountain, and uh, yeah, that's uh, she was sixty three years old, um, looked forty three, uh, was sixty three, but uh, yeah, uh, inside out a beautiful and a good woman, a great woman that supported me through very bad difficult times in the eighties. Uh, yeah, it was, that's the sad part of it. We deeply regret to hear this. Uh, our condolences. Yeah. By this life. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's very hard to. Uh, it's it's uh, because uh, the other thing is we knew each other from our childhood days. Uh, I've known her all her life. Uh, you know that was that's what makes it even worse. Uh, yeah, but um, they, uh, she's not a number. Uh, they do. They will sit there. Uh, they won't come out in my lifetime. Uh, yeah. So I did what I had to do. Well, internet, we've come to the end of a great episode. I must tell you that I really enjoyed talking to the Colonel here. It brought back some memories to me. I can even smell. I can smell the cause as I sit here in Switzerland. That is how real it is. And I want to thank you, sir. I've seen you quite often. During those months that I was in Tacosa, I would have seen you. You would have been uh, around. You have been surrounded by your men, loyal as they are. And you were always in command. And we never had any fear that you would make the wrong uh, decision. We had never any fear that you would refuse to make a decision. And that sir, is what I think is a good officer. So I thank you, sir. I thank you for that. Everybody listening here, remember, if you have a story to tell me, please come and talk to me. Just contact me, get hold of me, and uh, we will record you. And I'm sure you will feel better afterwards for talking to me. So after uh, all of this, let me say to you, until we meet again, God bless.